me. My name is Ksenia Kibazinski, and I am co-director of the Petro Yatsi program for the study of Ukraine here at the Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies, um, as well as librarian, a, a Slavic librarian at the University of Toronto Libraries. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our lecture today on Soviet industrial architecture and its afterlife in Eastern Ukraine. Um, we have, I'm delighted uh, to have here as a guest, uh, Christina Crawford, um, who is the Massey Martin NEH Professor of Art History at Emory University. Um, a little bit of background on Professor Crawford. She completed her master's in architecture and PhD at Harvard University. And she reminds me that she actually remembers me from my Harvard days um, at the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute. So it's always nice to, to kind of reconnect with people. Uh, Dr. Crawford is an author of several books, uh, two of which um, kind of overlap with the focus of the Ceres program here at U of T. Uh, one is the Spatial Revolution, Architecture and Planning in the Early Soviet Union, which came out with Cornell University Press in 2022. And uh, more recently, her book, uh, a co-edited volume on Detroit, Moscow, Detroit in Architecture for Industrialization, 1917 to 1945, that came out with MIT Press this year. Um, today, she'll be presenting on her, the earlier volume, um, which uh, has a focus on how in the 1920s and 30s, during Stalin's first five-year plan for industrialization, Soviet authorities invested heavily in capital projects in Kharkiv and the Donbass, which included the construction of a tractor factory on Kharkiv's outskirts, along with housing blocks for the workers, and this all on the brink and during the whole of the mod, uh, the irony of a tractor factory. Um, I would also say that uh, Crawford's interest is, is ongoing. It, this is not a one-time thing. Um, she uh, published a lovely photo essay entitled Love Letter to Ukraine in the Language of Architecture that came out on July 4th, 2022 on uh, the online platform. So, um, um, and, and we're gonna have about a 40 minute lecture and we're, we're, I'm delighted to have a discussant as well, who I'll introduce now across the table from me. Natalia Badakina is reference specialist at the Petra Yatsik Central and East European Resource Center at the University of Toronto Libraries. She has an MA in communication and culture, as well as a master's in information and a PhD in geography here at the University of Toronto, where she defended a doctoral dissertation on socialist constructions, modern urban housing, and social practice that explored architecture and public housing in the Weimar Republic and the Soviet Union, and how groups of actors such as city planners, architects, and tenant groups were involved in construction and policy making around publicly funded housing. And uh, more recently, she's been looking and investigating the work of Austrian urban planner and architect Margarita Schute Lohotsky, um, who carried um, carried out work in the Soviet Union in the 1930s. So it's really a privilege to have two people, two experts <laughs> on this. So uh, that will follow after. Christina Crawford's presentation, who, and I now turn the floor over to you. Okay, thank you so much, um, Sonia. Thank you in advance, Natalia. I'm very excited to, to speak with somebody who, who speaks my language, basically, of architecture. Um, thanks also to the Petroyatsik Program for the Study of Ukraine and the Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies. Um, so, uh, so the lecture, despite my best efforts, is closer to 45 minutes. <laughs> But I will, uh, uh, I, I promise to you know, give you plenty of beautiful images um, to help pass the time. 
So this drawing um, that I had up here is uh, from the steel factory complex in southeastern Ukraine that was designed in 1930, completed in 1933. At its inception, the plant was merely called the Mariupol Steel Factory. Uh, it's now no, known as Azovstal uh, or Azov Steel, named for the sea on which it sits, which offers easy shipping access to the Kamishburun's iron ore deposits on the Kerch Peninsula of Crimea. Once fully built out, the factory territory was 11 square kilometers or over four square miles, and was known in Mariupol as a city within a city. In addition to what sits on the surface, the plant has a five level basement complex, 36 bomb shelters, and a 24 kilometer tunnel system, 30 meters below ground. Before the full scale invasion, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, the plant employed more than 10,000 people. Now, because you're all aware of the destructive trajectory of the Russian war of aggression on Ukraine, you know that the factory was the site of Ukraine's last stand and the siege of Mariupol in the spring of 2022. So this is the site, uh, the state of the site after uh, the uh, devastated, uh, after the devastation of the siege. Now, aside from donating to every cause that I could in those months, I found that my ultimate utility in face of this war was to do what I do, which is to be an architectural historian. And to use my research to offer context for the site based on uh, my own work on early Soviet industrial architecture in Poland. So I pulled down my handbook of industrial construction. I really do have this on my bookshelf, uh, a, a, an incredibly dry volume and also very useful. It was published in the USSR in 1935. And, um, and of course, I found Azovstal, or the medieval steel factory, it was called at the time. Now, the facts that Azovstal was in these pages were not a surprise to me, nor was the fact that the design for Azovstal was based on the massive steel plant in Gary, Indiana, in the US, which had been completed in 1908, and was in fact a model for uh, many Soviet steel complexes built in the 1930s. So I added some broader context about these intense um, technical exchanges between the Soviet Union and the US, Germany, and other capitalist uh, countries during the time that Azovstal was built. And I posted it to the site formerly known as Twitter. Um, the response was really remarkable uh, from all corners of the globe. It was one of those rare moments when history and the present converge and when it feels like the work that we do as historians can be of some larger service. So in that vein, and for you, uh, I will exceed the 280 character limit to uh, offer a deeper view of the Russian war on Ukraine through the lens of architectural industrial history. Um, but before I go any further, I, I want to stress that my Ukrainian colleagues are doing this work every day and you should seek out their work. So Dome Publishers out of Berlin, and you can see the catalog um, on the left here, has been publishing a slate of books on Ukrainian architecture by Ukrainian architectural researchers. On the top right is an article um, by my friend, uh, Sophia Diak, who is the director of the Center for Urban History in Lviv, and, and many of you probably know um, Sophia. Um, and, I, and I put a little snapshot um, of their website below. Sophia is a true uh, public historian. Uh, and she writes beautifully in this piece, and I, and I just quote her. She says that, quote, my contribution comes from my perspective as both a scholar and a witness embedded in the contingency of the unfolding war in my home country, end quote. Now, Sophia's, uh, Sophia's uh, academic expertise in post-war architecture, uh, in fact, in sort of post-World War II uh, reconstruction um, is unfortunately now vital and she feels the weight of that responsibility. So after this talk, I just um, uh, encourage you to seek out her work um, and that of other Ukrainian historians of the built environment. So uh, in this talk, I will attempt um, very much from afar um, to answer the question, why does Azostal and Eastern Ukraine more broadly matter so much uh, in this war? So to address this question, um, I'll unfold an architectural history of the foundational period in which the factory was designed and built, 
the extractive and industrial landscape is crucial territory and its history engages politics, economics, and the built environment. So I'll use um, the Harakif Tractor Factory, another industrial site of this era that's um, featured in my recent book, um, to, to dive deeply into this context. Now the takeaways from the Harakif factor, Factory origin story can be extrapolated to other 1930s industrial sites in uh, Eastern Ukraine, like Azovstal, um, and to a certain extent, other industrial sites uh, in the Soviet Union. Um, so as uh, Ksenia noted, uh, the, the material for this talk comes uh, from two books, and it's sort of a sort of combination of the two. So I tell the Kharkiv story in uh, Spatial Revolution, my first um, monograph. And then my understanding of uh, these technical exchanges, uh, which I'll speak about from the 1930s, um, was deepened in uh, my research for Detroit, Moscow, Detroit, a book that I co-edited with um, the late Jean-Louis Cohen and um, Claire Zimmerman, who teaches here at Daniels. Uh, and that was re released by uh, MIT Press uh, just last month. Now, in my chapter for that book, um, I read a slew of memoirs that were written by American technical consultants who sort of you know, lived and worked um, sometimes for uh, multiple years in the USSR, helping to build the industrial base. Um, <clears throat> So um, even though now I'm a historian uh, of architecture and planning, I began my career as a practicing architect. I practiced for about you know, 10 years before going back to get my PhD. So the questions that I ask in my scholarship are certainly inflected by this time as a practitioner. And so namely, I'm interested in how, how designers operate, and particularly in these transitional periods like the early Soviet Union or the American New Deal, um, which is the subject of, um, of my research now. Uh, and what I found is that in, in such um, transitional or unstable times, um, experimentation, research, precedent sharing kind of across geographies um, is particularly robust. And we can see this iterative looping interaction between ideation, so theory and ideas, um, and actual materialization and, um, and built projects on the ground. So it's really architectural practice at its rawest state. So now I'm um, turning to Hadgi. So um, this image is from uh, 1929, uh, just outside of Hadgi, during the time that it was, uh, that Hadgi was the capital of the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. Um, the capital was returned to, to Kiev in 1934. Uh, this is an aerial drawing, a sort of bird's eye drawing of a Jil Kombinat, or living combine. Uh, it's an aspirational drawing. You can see this airplane swooping in from the upper right here, a vision of uh, modernity. It also happens to be a quite accurate um, picture of the final built version. The Harakip Tractor Factory and its socialist city that you're seeing here um, were implicated in this massive Soviet industrialization drive you know, during the first five-year plan. So the architectural tactics employed on the site, namely intense architectural and urban design standardization, significantly impacted Soviet development over the next 50 plus years. Now on February 24th, uh, 2022, the first uh, day of the most recent stage of the war, a missile landed on the playground of this site, and the windows were blown out of the six-story um, housing building, um, like the one you've just seen in uh, this drawing. So um, this right here is this, uh, many years later. Uh, like Azovstal, Hadkip II has again become implicated in Moscow's expansionist efforts. So there are three layered contexts that ground this story of industrial architecture and industrial uh, architectural industrialization. So first, I'll sketch out the political context, um, introduce you to the building context of Kharkiv uh, as the first Soviet Ukrainian capital. Uh, it's a site where architecture was called upon to establish the city's role as a new socialist metropolis <laughs> filled with intellectuals and skilled labor and importantly, uh, adjacent to the com commodities of grain and coal. Second, I'll discuss the economic context of the first five-year plan uh, from 1928 to 1932, uh, Stalin's hyper-industrialization drive. The plan also happened to coincide with the global economic depression 
and the near collapse of the construction industry in the US. So foreign architects and engineers out of work were driven into the welcoming arms of the Soviet state, keen for their expertise. Third, I'll analyze how architectural standardization brought the new factory online in record time. The design for the socialist city called New Kharkiv, adjacent to the tractor factory, uh, too employed architectural standardization for housing, social service buildings, and repeatable urban blocks. And I'll consider in conclusion how the planning innovations um, on uh, the Hadaki tractor factory site then ramified um, through the Soviet era, particularly in the 1960s, when standardized mass housing finally went to group. Now, the larger argument that I'm making here, and it's an architectural argument, so we'll walk you through it here, um, is that um, in the 1920s and 30s, the Soviet system harnessed these design tools of standardization and mass production that emerged in industry, moved into architecture, and then finally into planning. So what we have is an expansion um, from the tractor to the factory, to mass housing, to repeatable urban units. So this final stage, urban standardization, is what made Soviet uh, industrial expansion throughout Ukraine and in fact across the Eurasian continent possible. So it's this imperial drive to expand that we're seeing the latter day effects of in the Russian uh, war in Ukraine today. So to begin with the political context, you of course um, know where Hadagib is situated, uh, a mere 32 kilometers from the Russian border in Northeastern Ukraine. So the Bolsheviks claimed Kharkiv, the capital of Soviet Ukraine, as early as December 1917, while Kyiv, the former imperial era capital, stood as the contesting administrative center of the Ukrainian People's Republic. When the dust settled in the aftermath of the Civil War, Kharkiv became the sole capital of, the Soviet, of Soviet Ukraine. Now, it was in some ways a, a classic situation in urban history uh, and political history, new political regime, New capital. But where most commonly, say in uh, Abuja or Astana or Brasilia, like the new capital is moved closer to the territorial center of the nation, here it was moved eastward. So why? Well, Kharkiv boasts of qualities that made an, an attractive choice uh, for this new Ukrainian Bolshevik capital. From the 1880s, Kharkiv was the logistics center of mining in the region and the control center of the Southern Railway. The city stood to play an even more significant role in the early Soviet period as the transit and administrative center of the Donetsk Industrial Basin, or the Donbass. Uh, the considerable, considerable population of factory workers already living in the city um, offered immediate industrial potential. So from 1922 to 1934, it's 12 years um, as the sole capital, post-revolutionary Kharkiv proved an excellent site to test socialist space making and also economically. The city had an expanded political role and its population and, and industry just um, increased precipitously. So um, this 1932 chart plots uh, 12 categories of growth in the city uh, from 1913 uh, to 1932 and then projects their continued rise in the late 1940s. So I see this chart um, and I see buildings. <laughs> So construction of new governmental buildings, housing, hospitals, schools, and modern infrastructure was needed. And the Soviet state seemed poised to provide them. Um, the historical, just to locate you, the historical um, uh, center of the city is uh, at the confluence of the, the two rivers. Um, and then here, uh, just to the north, um, with the location of, a, of an entirely new um, sort of urban center or plaza. Um, uh, that is now called Freedom Square, Bolshev Slobody, the eighth largest city center square in Europe. Um, and I'm just going to talk briefly about um, the uh, the buildings that are on the lower left uh, corner of the, the archival photograph here. So um, architecture was the main tool to establish socialist state building iconography. So in 1925, an all-union competition was held for the design of the first and most prominent governmental building in Kharkiv, the Dish Rom, or the State Industry Building. Um, and this is the building that we just saw uh, holding one end of that plaza. The building's compositional liveliness 
um, is due to its variable mass. So it moves from kind of six to 12 stories. Um, at the ground, uh, I'm sure like many of you have been there, but at the ground, the building um, splits into three parts. So the streets, the city streets go kind of right uh, underneath the building. Uh, and then the buildings are, are reconnected by skyways at various levels uh, to visually represent cooperative collab collaboration in concrete and glass. Um, it's a spectacular way for at least a modernist architectural historian. Um, there were many other constructivist buildings, including the post office here, um, copious multi-unit housing projects were built um, before the capital was transferred back to Kiev in 1934. Um, I should mention that uh, Hadkeep's constructivist legacy is beautifully captured um, in this research and website created by a group of local architectural historians and practitioners. Um, many of these buildings, unfortunately, have been severely damaged by Russian selling, uh, shelling. Um, I highlight my uh, colleague here, Aksana Chebanyuk, um, who is an architectural history professor in Kharkiv um, and an author in Detroit, Moscow, Detroit. Uh, she's now teaching at the University of Michigan for the past two years. And I'll show just a couple of images from her chapter in a bit. So um, the economic context. So early Ukrainian Soviet architectural production was inextricably tied to political conditions like capital building, but also to specific economic conditions. So in the period that I look at um, in my first book, 1920 to 1932 or so, um, the Soviet Union passed through three economic periods, war communism, failed attempt at full-on uh, socialization of the economy, uh, the new economic policy or NEP, a kind of hybrid state capitalism, um, and then the first five-year plan, <clears throat> which, as I mentioned, was the hyper-industrialization drive, and really it's the reconsolidation of um, the centralized so socialist economy. Now, um, uh, what's important kind of from architectural history standpoint is that during the first five-year plan, the Soviet government pumped massive state funding into industrial <laughs> projects. Um, the aim was to catch up and overtake capitalism. So each um, icon on this uh, projective map. So this is a this is a sort of a, a map of desire, let's say, um, not fully instantiated, but um, but this is the plan um, for the first five year plan. Uh, and each of these icons is is a new or kind of existing but to be ex uh, expanded um, uh, industrial site in during the plan. This is a, an absurd undertaking, to be clear. Uh, many of these locations earmarked for heavy industry were undeveloped sites of, mi of mineral wealth, far removed from existing transportation infrastructure on the far side of the Urals and the like. Now, under these circumstances, architectural standardization became a key component of Soviet national planning and industrial development, because these kind of pop-up um, industrial complexes, which were a purview of American expertise, jibed with Soviet aspirations to develop these far-flung sites, um, production sites rapidly. And the first five-year plan map underscores the particular importance of the Donbass um, to the Soviet industrialization drive. So there are only three sites that merited kind of inset maps on this uh, national map at a larger scale, uh, Leningrad, Moscow, and the Donetsk Basin. Uh, equally important um, as the mineral resources of coal and iron ore uh, in the Donbass was the grain harvested in the in the Ukrainian ag agricultural heartland just beyond Kharkiv's borders that was sold on international markets to fund these heavy industrial projects. So remember this fact, <laughs> grain was the primary export that made these construction, uh, the construction promised by this plan possible. So agriculture, of course, and uh, industry can't be uh, uh, extricated from one another. Now, propaganda from the first five-year plan period often highlighted industrializing projects in southern and eastern Ukraine as key to the success of the Soviet industrialization effort. Crimea on the left and the Donbass on the right were crucial sites for Soviet industrial expansion. 
their illegal occupation and annexation by Russia starting in 2014 underscores their continued economic importance. Now, the ambitious timetable for the first five-year plan that had been set by the Soviet state's economic planners just did not allow for uh, a period of internal architectural research and development. Industrial architecture was already well established in the US by that time, however. So what I'm showing you here is, um, is uh, the Ford uh, River Rouge plant just outside of Detroit. Um, this is a project that was um, very well known to and frequently visited by uh, Soviet industrial planners. So American expertise in industrial construction uh, was simply coveted by the Soviets. And indeed, in the two decades after the revolution, up to 80,000 foreign workers, specialists, and political exiles traveled to work in the Soviet Union. Um, I particularly like this photo. Uh, this is from uh, Nizhny Novgorod in 1932, the site of a Soviet Ford factory. Um, and what the caption notes is that every fedora is an American technical expert <laughs> who has come to work on the site. And a lot of them, I mean, you can, they're, <laughs> they're everywhere uh, is the bottom line. Um, and although a precise number is, is quite difficult to establish, there were likely around 2,000 American technical consultants, consultants working for the Soviet government between 1928 and 1933, but the peak of the exchange was in 1931. So um, the, the bulk of these technical consultancies to the USSR began after the October 1929 stock market crash. So economic collapse in the capitalist world conspired to lock American and Soviet industry together mutually and beneficially. The Soviet government took advantage of near stoppage of US industrial development during the depression to draw American assist, uh, assistance on the first five-year plan projects. So as the US economy tanked, as you can see on the right, the Soviet economy was on the rise. Now, Detroit in particular played host to a stream of Soviet visitors seeking US firms and, and individuals with whom to partner. Albert Kahn, uh, the architect of Henry Ford and the River Rouge plant, was targeted by the Supreme Soviet of the national economy precisely because of the firm's legendary speed. Using standardized architectural types and with all design departments working in parallel rather than sequentially, Albert Kahn Inc. could crank out the plans for a factory in a matter of days. So Kahn's firm was contracted by the Soviet government to design a single tractor factory for Stalingrad. Uh, and I'm showing you just a part of that here. Um, architectural types like the forge shop uh, were already tried and tested on US projects and um, then simply adjusted for Soviet conditions. Uh, in Kahn's archive at the University of Michigan sits this construction administration scrapper for Mr. Albert Kahn. <laughs> by made by his um, Soviet clients um, to chart the uh, construction activities on the Stalingrad site. Now, this project was deemed a success. Uh, it led to a two-year agreement between the Soviet government and Albert Kahn Inc., making the Detroit design firm consulting architects for all. Uh, yes. Sorry, where is this book right now? It's in it, um, so it's at the um, the Bentley Historical Library at University of Michigan. Yeah, and in fact, um, uh, a lot of Albert Kahn Inc., so, so this Detroit-based um, firm, a lot of his papers are, are at University of Michigan, um, including a lot of materials from their Soviet uh, trips. <laughs> yeah, because I was in Detroit at the Henry Ford Museum um, in Detroit, I didn't find much. Okay. Right. Yeah, and the firm actually is, is also still still exists and is still active, but their papers at the firm are kind of a mess, but they picked, uh, they handpicked some of the best bits and gave them to University of Michigan and they're, and they're very easy to access. Um, so, so yeah, this is just the tip of the iceberg basically. But this, this particular construction administration book is stunning. It's really remarkable. So you can go to the library and basically touch it, right? Can you touch it? Absolutely. Yeah. University of Michigan. Which one? The Michigan, Michigan like the Michigan or, uh, or Ann Arbor? Like, like Ann Arbor. Uh, in, in, in Ann Arbor. Okay. Yeah, okay. exactly. 
It's oh, very close to the digitized. Right? digitized. Can, can we maybe hold off for the, the for discussion of source material? Uh, okay. Yes, words. and I'm happy, thank I'm you happy to for your questions. About that. No, and we'll, I'm sure the source material will be a question. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, so on to tractors, which I know much more about now than I ever expected to. Um, so tractors were this crucial piece of machinery that were necessary to meet these grain extraction poles, uh, goals that were that required, that the plan required. There were not nearly enough, and most were in fact uh, imported from the United States. So um, this chart that I made uh, charts the projected tractor production increase just for Kharkiv over the year 1929. So from January to December 1929, Hubkeep's tractor building targets increased by 500%. So important to note, these are targets. <laughs> you know, the Soviet government says, Hubkeep, you will produce, you know, anywhere from one to um, 50,000 tractors, right, over the course of this year. Um, so uh, the small existing tractor factory in Hubkeep could not keep up with this production, and another bigger factory needed to be built. So. In November 1929, uh, a memo was drawn up by the regional industrial planners on the choice of Kharkiv as the site for the construction of a new southern tractor factory. Now, this report opened with this list of preconditions for this factory, which included the guarantee of a 15-month construction period, an assurance that the full production of 50,000 tractors would be met at the end of two years' time. Now, again, this timeline left scant seven months to prepare the drawings prepare the site and the labor pool uh, for the construction of this factory and the adjacent residential settlement um, or socialist city, Sotnisko in uh, Ukrainian or Sotsko in Russian. Now, um, miraculously, uh, this industrial complex was more or less completed on that breakneck schedule, um, thanks to architectural standardization. But a very particular kind of Soviet inflected standardization so the plan had been to copy Khan's Stalingrad tractor factory, which you're seeing on the left, um, exactly for Kharkiv on the right, um, as that was the only way the kind of schedule could be met. And uh, this is just rotated 180 degrees to orient you. Now, the form and the dimensions of the plan, as you can see, are identical. And I can tell you that I scanned them, put them in AutoCAD, aligned them. They're the, like the structural bays, everything's the same. Um, but there were many alterations that had to be made for the Kharkiv factory, including a significant material change from steel to concrete. So this process by which a standard type is kind of tweaked and adjusts to um, accommodate local conditions um, has a specific, a specific term um, in Russian, privyaska, or architectural adjustment. So the massive uh, Harikiv tractor factory complex was able to begin production of tractors so swiftly because the factory itself was a product of the architectural standardization. Um, Soviet inflected, contingent, privyazka, but standardization, all the same. Um, I had to include this. So just a quick note, um, I'm on sabbatical, um, but I'm teaching a third year uh, urban history course at the Harikiv School of Architecture. Um, uh, which has been re relocated to Lviv um, since 2022. And I had the students um, conduct a research and give a presentation on the Hapkip Tractor Factory uh, just this past week. Um, and, uh, and in fact, none of them had been there and none of them knew of this um, site or uh, its importance, but, um, but now they do. So um, the lessons of assembly line mass production of the object, meaning the tractor, were then assumed and implemented to the production fac facility itself, the factory, with the help of American industrial engineers and architects. Um, now, in total, Khan's office records confirm that 531 factories, based upon their drawings and specifications, were completed in the USSR by the time uh, the two-year consultancy was over. There's a pause for a second. 531 factories in two years. So um, the, this kind of the number of unconfirmed facilities based upon plans or details developed by Khan's office um, is likely in the thousands, in fact. Uh, the Soviet State Design Institute simply absorbed American typologies and details and then carried them well into decades, um, into later decades through kind of strategic adjustments from site to site. So the built result um, is a collection of industrial complexes 
that resemble one another sort of like siblings as opposed to, let's say, twins. Um, and this is, I, I guess I would say, just to, to pause for one second, um, this is something that architectural history in a way brings to the table. That if you're able to read the drawings, if you're able to read the um, installations themselves, you can see um, perhaps what, what texts will not permit you to see. Um, so the material facts um, of these places matter. Now the relationship between the Gary Steel plant and Nazovstal can be also understood in terms of Kriviazka. So obviously the Ukrainian complex adjusted to the contours of this new site, but the project was also sub and um, the project was also subject to differing material delivery labor supply conditions um, that then affected the final uh, ensemble. Um, and just as an aside, I became um, really interested in this research to suss out what the Soviet experience imported to the foreign consultants, which is to say that there's there has been scholarship about um, the influence on kind of you know American industrial techniques on the Soviet Union, but what about the looping effect? Um, it's a harder argument to make, um, but I'm convinced that um, this episode was not just a, a matter of technical transfer, but like the technical exchange. And in fact, American construction managers um, on sites like Tadkiv or Azovstal um, had to learn to think on their feet. They had to learn to be um, uh, sort of adapt to less than ideal um, construction circumstances. And this proved um, very useful when they came back and many of them worked on big New Deal and, and, uh, infrastructure projects in the US. Uh, so um, let's see how the lessons of architectural standardization learned from the factory then imply, uh, impacted the design of Soviet worker housing. So this um, industrial residential settlement was called New Harkiv. The whole complex was built um, 10 kilometers outside of Kharkiv center um, on this main um, kind of long haul train line, uh, you know, from the north um, all the way down to the Caucasus. So we're seeing here, um, here's the kind of um, traditional urban center of Kharkiv, and then 10 kilometers out, um, this uh, is uh, new Kharkiv from the Kharkiv uh, tractor factory. Um, <clears throat> So uh, the factory uh, that you see on the top and then the residential area below were designed by separate design teams and they actually ran on different schedules. So while the project team for the factory was working to adjust the Stalingrad factory plans to the site, the new Kharkiv um, Sotsnista project was assigned to the Ukrainian architect Pablo Aloshin, who with a team of young architects, many um, just architectural students, um, produced the project with just incredible speed. Now the plan's um, distinctive form marks it as one of the only constructed examples of the theoretical model known as the Soviet linear city. The linear city's main proponents, uh, the former commissar of finance of the Russian Republic, Nikolai Milutin, stressed that new socialist settlements should be organized according to industrial principles. So he wrote, and I'll quote him, a flowing functional assembly line system is the absolutely ne necessary basis for the new planning. The residential sector of the settlement must be set up parallel to the productive zone, and must be separated from it by a green belt buffer zone. This productive uh, protective strip must be no less than 500 meters wide. And the idea here was that the green zone acted as the kind of lungs of the project, um, just kind of filter any stray industrial particulates that might um, drift toward the residential zone. So again, to, to, to look very quickly, you know, the, the form of the city is, is predicated on the rail line. And then you have the production zone or the factory, 500 meter uh, you know, green bands, uh, residential zone, park, river, and then of course the winds are always blowing in the right direction, right? Uh, sort of away from uh, the factory and the residential area, as if that were possible. Um, now the deal uh, and why this works so well, at least conceptually, is that each worker had a short 10 to 20 minute walk um, across the green zone uh, to the factory. And then this green zone also structures uh, rational linear growth in either direction along its length while maintaining this optimal distance um, between living and working. 
Uh, this type of linear growth is also virtually boundless. You can imagine these you know, sinuous lines of developments snaking through the vast Soviet uh, territories along these uh, long haul rail lines. Now, curiously, um, this drawing uh, that I found in the ar archives um, suggested that uh, Kharkiv might in future be surrounded by such linear cities, um, these industrial residential settlements running along uh, main transportation lines. But um, to the best of my knowledge, uh, New Kharkiv uh, was the only one that was actually built. Very beautiful drawing. Uh, so an early version of the socialist city site plan reveals this exact layering of program, except flipped 180 degrees. So it's divided into the parallel zones. You've got heavy rail to the north with um, a, a kind of tentatively penciled in a tractor factory, uh, the green zone exactly uh, 500 meters, um, and then the residential zone and then open land uh, beyond there. And um, a close look at the contemporary um, aerial of New Kharkiv before the Russian bombing of the sites um, shows that it was built exactly as planned. So these five linear zones down to the exactly 500 meter green zone are still legible in the fabric. I mean, as, a, as an urban historian, it's, it's a remarkable artifact. So this, the socialist city, Sotsmisto, was the name of the entire residential area across from the factory. It was composed of these repeatable blocks known as living combines or gil complexe or gil combinati. In this close-up of five blocks, you can see that there are just um, three block designs uh, mirrored about this center line, each with a limited number of housing and social service building types. <clears throat> now, each living combine uh, was designed to hold 2,500 residents and accommodate all their basic needs. So we have kindergartens, schools, worker clubs, um, small shops, and sometimes cinemas, et cetera, built into these blocks, along with the housing. Now, the socialist city was the name for the entire uh, composition, all living combines together to reach a population of 25,000 to 50,000 total residents. So the architectural language and, and each of the elements of this um, combine are articulated in this bird's eye perspective that we saw earlier. So in the, in the foreground, you've got two narrow six-story bar buildings um, that hold dormitory-style you know, living cells for, for single people. Uh, six four-story bars uh, behind them hold um, multi-room family units. In the middle of the composition is this round nose workers club that was attached to a communal dining hall and a mechanized laundry. And then at the back of the block are these four identical uh, education buildings of elementary schools, kindergartens, nurseries, um, shops, as I said, clinics, recreational facilities also built into these blocks. Uh, now, the plan of the six-story uh, housing types show what the individual units were like. They were called living cells, uh, six square meters or 64 square feet. Um, and uh, so here's the living cell. You've got a little uh, sort of sink to yourself. Um, you share a bathroom, uh, a common area. When I show these to my American students, they say, oh, it's a dorm. I'm like, <laughs> well, it's a, yes, basically it's a dorm. Um, here, uh, it's, it's a little bit of a hard um, to get your head around, but once you do, you'll see it. Um, so here's an axonometric drawing. So you can see, again, the little sink, you know, maybe some shelves for your books, a little uh, desk for edifying political reading, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and a bed, and that's it, right? You're only supposed to really sleep here. Um, and this poster from Soviet Ukraine makes clear life is to be lived in the public realm. So you eat with your comrades in the canteen, you recreate in the workers' club, you extract coal, you sleep. Period. So um, here are some views of New Kharkiv just after con con construction. Um, and you can see a like, very generous exterior space. Um, in fact, 80% of the site was left unbuilt with a shared green space. Um, and the landscape uh, as it has grown up uh, is, uh, is today quite lovely. Uh, the architecture is uh, perhaps we could call austere <laughs> um, and filled with these tiny units. Um, anecdotally, we know that the living cells were not popular. Um, they were built without kitchens, I should have uh, specified. Uh, we could see that in the plan, but uh, well, just to be clear. Um, so walls were knocked down to make family apartments, hot plates were smuggled in um, to the kitchen units, et cetera. But the social infrastructure was successful and persisted uh, through uh, the Soviet era. 
And so while the residential buildings were austere, the architecture of social programming was quite exuberant. And this is because the residential and the social were understood as a kind of integral package uh, to be understood together and in balance with one another. So, um, so the kindergartens that you're seeing in the color shots here um, from about uh, 10 years ago, um, and uh, the workers club on the upper left um, were allowed to be kind of idiosyncratic because it was their job in the urban unit to communicate the dynamic potential of commonality. So here we see the lessons learned from the factory, standardization, impactful design, and mass product, uh, produced housing types. Um, now, in my book, um, Haruki is the final site. So I look at Baku, Magnitogorsk, um, and, and Haruki. And I largely paint it as an architectural success story for the reasons I think embedded in this diagram. Um, I also make clear in the book, however, that it's important to temper assignation of success to this project. And the war also demands full contextualization of the violence of this historical era in Ukraine. So, um, so we know from memoirs that outside the high brick wall that surrounded the factory, each entrance of which was guarded by a soldier with a loaded rifle and a fixed bayonet was manufactured famine and genocide, the whole of Omar. Now, as you'll recall, uh, grain grown in the Ukrainian countryside was earmarked as the primary Soviet export to fund the capital projects like the Hutki tractor factory. But uh, many small scale subsistence farmers resisted by retaining their harvested grain, which meant that export production uh, projections built into the economic model for the industrialization drive became untenable. And as the historian Moshe Levine put it, the great risk to the Soviet state was that, and I, and I quote him, the countryside, not properly controlled and mastered, could wreck the whole effort. So uh, forced architecture, uh, agricultural collectivization turned Kharkiv into a haunted city from 1932 to 34, uh, overpopulated by the peasants whose villages were subsumed into this now collective territory. The forced famine affected every corner of Ukraine. And I shared just um, two of these really wonderful maps from uh, Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute's Great Famine Project. Um, so the first shows the blacklisted entities and districts um, of the country that suffered most during the periods that uh, the Hadgir Tractor Factory, um, Azovstal, the uh, Dnipra Hiss, and other first five-year plan industrialization projects were being completed. The second uh, is the devastating map that quantifies Soviet Ukrainian deaths during this two year period of the Holodomor. Uh, and you know these numbers. So 4.5 million famine losses, 3.9 million excess deaths, uh, 0.6 million lost births. Again, to be clear, um, this manufactured famine intended uh, to force compliance with Soviet agricultural collectivization to bankroll industrial expansion. And my point in sharing this information in a history, uh, architectural history lecture um, is to underscore the point that, of course, Ukraine has been materially impacted by conjectural choices by kind of politicians from Moscow before. And that also as architectural historians um, were ethically obligated to interrogate the context that gave rise uh, to the objects of study. So I'm gonna pull out um, just one more time uh, to discuss the implications of Soviet design standardization on the continental scale. So as the Soviets were at pains to remind world leaders and their own population, the USSR constituted a full one sixth of the earth's land mass. And that territory was only useful, however, if harnessed. So the immense natural resources, the vast territories had to be reached and settled. And this task was one of the main drivers of the first five year plan. The plan was, in effect, at least I argue, an effort to take control of this land mass. So if we understand um, each icon here is an industrial settlement, um, how do you quickly populate these dots on the map? Standardized urban units. So in the end, the first five-year plan helps us to understand how architects and planners became implicated in what um, Timothy Snyder and others deem internal colonization of Soviet territories that expanded Russophone industrialization efforts to the north, south, and east. So this is um, the end of the standardization line from tractors to territory. 
these uh, this kind of logic of pre-designed urban units quickly installed in any nearly any condition was the answer to the Soviet desire to settle and make productive this land under their control. So the desire to replicate industrial concerns, the residential quarters quickly across these vast territories was fulfilled through this interscalar standardization of architectural details, building types, and settlement modules. Uh, Haruki was certainly not alone, it's just one example. Um, here are pages from Aksana Chabanyuk's chapter in uh, our Detroit, Moscow Detroit book. Um, and uh, she talks about Niprahes, uh, for instance, um, which also used limit, limited architectural types to generate kind of pop-up cities um, for industrial worker populations in this area. Now the project to control territory and settle the Soviet population and dispersed patterns like really came to fruition uh, but later in the 20th century after Stalin's death. So when Khrushchev initiated a massive push to standardize and mass produce residential buildings um, and uh, neighborhoods, uh, this is kind of the, the end of the line. So these concrete panel high rises that became synonymous with Soviet block housing um, was at least I argue sort of the continuation of the standardization and dispersion of the efforts of the late 20s and early 30s. And the housing, as you know, was constructed of a limited number of types, um, but the neighborhood, too, was a packaged unit replicable throughout Soviet territories. So the living combine was renamed uh, Nico Rayon, <laughs> but the basic form and the principles of kind of self-sufficiency kind of within this autonomous unit um, were more or less the same. So um, uh, to conclude, the incredible um, density of resources in Donbass and uh, throughout Ukraine holds uh, a special place in the Russian imaginary. And uh, Putin's administration is willing to undertake short-term destruction for long-term control. And of course, this should sound familiar to the situation in Soviet Ukraine in the 1930s. Stolen grain too continues uh, to serve Moscow's quest for land and power. So I'll finish where I began as of stall in the present moment. Uh, industrial sites like this are the legacy of previous violence inflicted, inflicted on this territory. The rapid industrialization of Ukraine in the 1930s to which um, this project certainly belongs was a deeply exploitative project that entailed brutality during and environmental degradation after its construction. But the negative history is now, however, in dialogue with a countervailing narrative. The Azovstal complex has become a, a material artifact and symbol of Ukrainian resistance, and its meaning um, has and is being transformed through its persistence over nearly a century, and ultimately um, through its utility to Ukrainians in war. And in fact, uh, in July of this year, uh, four Ukrainian architectural teams revealed uh, visions for a post-war of medieval. Um, and these are just um, two uh, beautiful renderings here. And you can see um, you know, in these renderings, um, they're on the Azovstal site. So we should see in this uh, industrial architecture, um, the Ukrainian's capacity uh, to flip the script, such that buildings like these, clearly emblematic of the Soviet era in which they were built, um, can become representative of independent and sovereign Ukraine absorbing new cultural and governmental entities and new everyday life. So in post-war reconstruction, um, these will assume new cultural imports as sites and buildings that bore the brunt of Russian aggression. Thank you. Oh, and um, I would be remiss if I didn't share two different ways of supporting uh, reconstruction of the built environment uh, in Ukraine. So uh, Habke School of Architecture, as I mentioned, that's in uh, training future Ukrainian architects and urbanists uh, who will be uh, critical to reconstruction efforts. Um, and there was this, I don't, it's a, a kind of a small effort, but really interesting one, the Habke uh, Shemshul project, um, which is, you know, at a much smaller scale, you know, sort of helping to reconstruct uh, individual houses in a smaller rural area. Um, so, with that, um, so let me go yeah. back to um, previous, um, previous mm -hmm. on the bottom. Yeah, is, is it like a, a former drama theater or? I I think so. I think that's right. I mean, I've not been to Mariupol, so I don't know the site um, particularly well. But um, 
Because it looks like it looks like the side, yeah, and in the back it's the charge. So the Russians they bomb with it was three hundred fifty. Oh, yeah, the children, the children. Yeah. Exactly. So I think it's on the. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think you're right. I think that's right. Yeah. So, thank you. Yes. Of course. <laughs> my pleasure. My pleasure. Um, before we take questions from the audience online and in. And here in the room, uh, I invite Dr. Barakina to offer some kind of uh, discussion remarks and maybe some questions to lead. And I ask you to speak loudly so that the people online can hear. Would it be better if I go sit next to you? Would, do I you don't know where the mic I think this I think is it's the mic. So this just, is the yeah, mic. I think the owl is yeah. the mic. <laughs> okay. Then I'll try to project it. So yes. I think so. Okay. so. Just let me know if I'm and then, quiet. And while she's speaking, you can think about your questions too. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Crawford, for your presentation. Um, in an interview to the director of the film Sotsgorod, Socialist City, Anna Abrams, in 1995, Austrian architect Margarete Shutlipotsky commented on conditions of her work in the Soviet Union in the 1930s. She said, there was no modern construction industry, not at all. How can you build modern houses without modern techniques? They couldn't make big window panes. There was no iron. We weren't allowed to use iron for house building. That was all used to build up industry. Modern architecture had shipwrecked. The climate was not suitable. It just didn't work. As a reaction, they built fancy towers." End quote. In this quotation, Shutlipotsky brings into focus conditions of uh, extreme material scarcity that the architects worked under during the first half year plan and laments the defeat of the modern architectural experimentation, its eventual demise under the doctrine of socialist realism. And fancy towers probably refer to the competitions for the Soviets in 1931 to 1933, which marked a reorientation in Stalinist architectural policy and the final halt to experiments in socialist city planning. In Special Revolution, Architecture and Planning in the Early Soviet Union, Christina Crawford situates her work against scholarly narratives of inevitable demise and uh, subsequent failure of visionary early Soviet architecture and planning. Crawford redirects the narrative by highlighting that socialist planning was not solely a visionary and paper-based project, which we witnessed in this talk today as well. Um, instead, she traces how built socialism took shape in three different urban contexts which she calls experimental enclaves for Baku, Magnitogorsk, and Kharkiv, engagingly integrating the rich archives of drawings, site plans, maps, and photographs. Crawford's project extends the line of questioning by scholars who are trying to escape the schematic theoretical framework of top-down socialist planning, and who question rigidity of a socialist realist canon in the arts, including architecture and planning. Heather Dehan, for example, in her work on Nizhny Novgorod, investigates shiftiness that defined, defined urban planning at the time, where mechanisms uh, for building, quote, were repeatedly shuffled, reorganized, and then restructured yet again. Crawford calls attention to local specificity of socialist urban planning, rather than viewing it as a top-down and homogenizing project. Up until the late 1930s, she writes, socialist spatial practices and forms emerged not by ideological edict from above, but through on the ground experimentation by practitioners in collaboration with local administrators, their practices by doing. Attuned to the political context of changing directives and of the shifted ideological terrain, Crawford outlines how architects acted. She suggests an approach of nodal history, which centers intervention, problem solving, or praxis, and traces how architectural and planning praxis unfolded in these three sites through trial and error and by iterative movement between theory and practice. Uh, she writes, in the design and construction projects undertaken during the first decades of Soviet rule, spatial problems and their solutions revealed themselves through an intense engagement with context. To interrogate circulation of planning ideas and designs, Crawford shows how the practice of Privyaska operated in the process of formation of a distinctly Soviet version of architectural standardization. This distinct version was characterized by strategic reconfiguration of the original artifact, what we saw today, to meet conditions of the new site. Through Privyaska, Kharkiv tractor factory became such a site where ideas from Stalingrad could be modified and improved, and in turn, methods of standardization applied there then became 
further utilized uh, in the building of uh, the new uh, socialist city, New Kharkiv. So the process of Privyaska allowed uh, Stalingrad uh, tractor factory design to be exported into the Kharkiv site and the Kharkiv plan designs were revised uh, for the plan to be built right away of concrete. Yes. But as mentioned in the talk, given limitations on imperfect steel and this material limitation, however, served also as a kind of beneficial development because it allowed for various kinds of workers to apply their skills uh, and or, uh, on, in the newly, or to be newly trained. Crawford importantly underscores uh, international context of early Soviet planning. A uh, nodal approach uh, allows her to focus on her select construction sites as participating in a global network of shared expertise and to emphasize internationalist character of architectural and planning interventions. In mid-20s, as numerous Soviet delegations of architects, planners, engineers, and representatives of major building organizations visited European and American congresses uh, and exhibits, such visits became a part of uh, focused state politics in order to systematically study Western experience and building practices of mass housing and standardization of construction, as Evgenia Konishova points out. During the first five-year plan, foreign architects became a part of the Soviet state-sponsored effort to research methods of uh, standardization for industrial construction and housing. And we saw in the talk today, and it was in the chapters, how standardized designs developed by Detroit-based Albert Kahn company migrated internally uh, between Soviet construction sites from Stalingrad to uh, Kharkiv tractor factory. New Kharkiv was being designed as the debates about what socialist uh, city should be uh, were taking place. Uh, so there was uh, there was really intense uh, really uh, in exchanges among architects and planners and policymakers uh, about uh, the shape that uh, this uh, project uh, uh, should be taken. So there was um, the camp of the so-called urbanists, whose positions were articulated by Lev Sobsovich, who defended the resettlement of people into collectivized settlements consisting of communal houses clustered around the factory. And then on the other side, there were there was kind of a disurbanist, uh, what is called disurbanist camp, uh, uh, with Mikhail Akutovich, who argued instead for decentralized forms of settlement made up of uh, prefabricated houses spread out in uh, natural settings. And eventually, Soviet plan and official discourse effectively shut down uh, these deliberations about the nature of social city as uh, kind of being an open-ended uh, experimental project by issuing um, a resolution on uh, uh, on the work of restructuring of the everyday life in which um, these types of uh, discussions were denounced and um, kind of extreme communalization of life was uh, um, uh, was deemed kind of harmful and utopian and uh, uh, the architect Alushan, Al Alushan and his team worked in this shifting <clears throat> ideological terrain. I think the book is really doing a beautiful job of showing how contemporaneous all, all those things were, like the work of the architects, but also those those discussions. Um, so they worked without so-called roadmap um, and um, uh, sort of on the go conducting this very extensive research uh, to be informed about about the shape that uh, that this uh, that these debates were taking uh, place, and um, Crawford found rich evidence of Alushan engagements through uh, annotated works uh, in Alushan's personal library. Uh, and here I'm going to move on to sort of uh, uh, question and then open the floor to discussion. And I think there are so many fascinating topics emerging uh, in in this part of the book uh, that I've tried to focus on in, in this talk. Um, such as first-hand accounts of everyday life, uh, including foreign observers' accounts. Uh, the book also pays careful attention to laborers involved in constructions, to relations between the urban context and surrounding countryside, uh, to how materiality of the building site uh, was actually implicated in the unfolding violence of politicization. And I would like to wrap up with um, yeah, just a few uh, kind of comments slash question. Question. So the first one, uh, I'm going to go ahead and address the primary sources. Uh, and um, your project uh, is based on extensive archival research. And, and I found your uh, reflection on uh, um, uh, your reflection on your own archival research uh, process really interesting. And the uh, discussion discoveries in uh, Alotion's uh, archives, both in Ukraine and in Canada, are truly fascinating. And uh, uh, commenting on archival serendipity in the introduction, you wrote that 
Aloshan's methods and peculiarities of record keeping, uh, he did not uh, discard any books or any work he worked with. So, it's, so that's that then served as, as rich uh, material for, for, the, for the research. Um, informed several of your discussions. So not just initially as planned of Kharkov uh, track factor, but also Homokitogos with a different chapter uh, and provided this really new, new and rich evidence for, for, for the city, uh, uh, which planning has been discussed by several others previously. Um, because his library was too large for his apartment, um, Christine writes uh, that in, when in 1919, he applied to, to the Soviet authorities for a new Flat, he actually justified his application by the fact that he has this huge library and um, it was a cr crucial productive tool used every day. That's how he, he, he named this library. So I kind of found this perilous interesting that these records uh, also became a productive tool for you so that they became formative for your own uh, research process and not as a kind of just supplementary and illustrative material, but actually as actively directing inquiry. Um, I'm also a trained archivist, so I'm really interested in kind of archival uh, theory behind 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 the way we approach materials. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, of course, just your um, input as an architect and your um, you, you, your ability to read is that I think is really paramount to, to the project. Um, so again, so my question is um, uh, my question is really broad. Uh, in terms of archival serendipity, uh, would you be interested in sharing any archival uh, encounters uh, or just general uh, advice to archival researchers who navigate the multiplicity of records dispersed in various uh, archives across different cultural contexts, uh, maybe of some kinds of um, lights on which uh, those archival discoveries took you that maybe were not included in this book, but uh, perhaps might um, sort of um, become um, avenues uh, offer avenues for mm. future inquiry. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Natalia. It's um uh it's always it's so interesting to to hear your own ideas <laughs> come back at you and <laughs> processed and in a different way. I really um thank you so much. Um maybe I'll I can't I'm trying to remember if I have anything in here that's from um Alyoshin's I mean but much of this material is actually from Alyoshin's archive. Um, which is in the literature and art arts archives in in Kiev, and um, there are so many instances of archival serendipity. I can't even begin, you know. Um, but uh, but I have a, a Ukrainian colleague, uh, Elena Mavrusova, who who um, is an expert on uh, uh, Alyoshin. And we met for coffee, and she's, you know, and I, I guess I was in, I was in Kiev, and I was going to work at the, um, the architectural library in, in Kiev, and she said, well, well, why wouldn't you go to, you know, this archive? This is where all of Alyosha's um, materials are, and it was, I mean, um, for an architectural historian to come across a, a blueprint like this, just, you know, like it was, uh, it's absolute gold. Um, because it's not, uh, I mean, as you said, for an architectural historian, um, this is not just an illustration, it's, it's evidence, <laughs> I guess I would say. So the the graphic materials in, in particular um, become so crucial because um, they allow for deep analysis, deep spatial um, analysis in comparison to other, um, let's say, like sites in perhaps very um, uh, disparate contexts, whether it's uh, Frankfurt or um, or Detroit, let's say. Um, but the I, I think the archival serendipity that I that I speak about or that I write about a bit in the introduction um, was the most extraordinary e example where um, the Canadian Center for Architecture, which is located in Montreal, has um, has their own absolutely beautiful library with archive. And um, the architectural historian Jean Louis Cohen, who was a co editor of Detroit, Moscow, Detroit, who just um, passed away in August, um, was able to convince the CCA that they should um, buy, I think it was maybe back in the 1990s, there was some archival you know, stuff uh, that was uh, Soviet uh, era architectural and, and urban planning materials um, that they should, they should buy them. Um, 
And so I was there to kind of poke around um, that material and in fact asked for this kind of planning book from the 19, late 1920s, early 1930s. Um, it shows up on the cart and I open it up and um, the flyleaf has the the name and signature of Pablo Alyosha. It's like, I was like, what? <laughs> right? So the, and it turned out, so so I went back to the archivist and she said, oh yeah, we've got about, I don't know, 45 or 50 books from his personal library. Um, that, uh, and that ended up just being like extraordinarily valuable because um, these are planning tomes, you know, from the time at which this project is being uh, designed, they're talking about kind of urban theory. Um, he's a very, very well practiced um, and experienced architect at this point, um, but he's having to, to read very closely this urban theory that's developing at that time. Like, how do you, like, how do you make socialist space? It's like, oh, I don't know, it's like, I better read. Um, so he starts reading and he's annotating and, and, and I could sort of like read through his annotations and what he's underlining, what, what is interesting to him. And, um, and aspects of kind of emerging socialist spatial ideas that uh, that end up in these drawings and then end up built in Pudpute. It was just um, extraordinary, actually. Um, so I guess, you know, moving across these various modes from, um, you know, from annotated personal books to drawings to, um, memoranda um, and trying to piece together as much as possible the conditions, um, uh, you know, the, the kind of real conditions on the site as this project was being developed um, became a real, it became really fun. <laughs> and I'm sure there, you know, there may be parts where I'm sort of connecting dots that may not be quite right. Like I, I completely, um, completely acknowledge that, um, that fact that we're, we're always limited by what by what we can we can track down in the in the present day, but um, but I think by using a heterogeneous um, kind of group of materials, maybe we get closer. That's but, interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. I have a question, and but but I I'm also open to taking some from the floor, and this will kind of move away a bit from architecture. Although I have a second question that that will reflect that, but again, talking about source material and the richness of what you uncovered, um, perhaps there are avenues for scholars uh, looking at the whole of the mod, um, sources that have not been looked at, and I'm thinking 80,000 workers in the Soviet Union um, are writing home, probably uncensored letters, I would Thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm thinking the Khan archive as well. Um, did you encounter anything there, or is there you think you know material that I think is that maybe has been ignored because we know that there are published accounts of more famous travelers, journalistic accounts mm -hmm. going to Moscow and then traveling from Moscow down into Soviet Ukraine and Kharkiv, and so we do have those recollections, but, but this seems like there could be even reading between the lines, mm -hmm. um, whether you came across anything. Uh, you weren't looking for that specifically, but yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so there's one American uh, labor organizer, union organizer named Fred Beal, who um, ends up uh, in the Soviet Union, he's he's sent to the Kharkiv site um, to work as basically an an, an organizer for um, for the foreign workers on the site. And there were Czechs and Germans and um, and Americans as well. Um, I think more or less the common common language was English. And so he's doing kind of agitation on the site. Um, and the reason he was in the Soviet Union was because he had been you know, basically, you know, convicted in 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 the United States for uh, for union organizing. Was charged. It's a very long, interesting story. It was charged with murder that he didn't commit. Anyway, so he ends up in the Soviet Union um, and that hot And uh, in his um, his memoir, 
Um, he, uh, he, he very much encounters the whole on, on the site and, um, and writes of it uh, after he returns to the United States. Um, to be clear, he sort of escapes um, ultimately. Um, it is very, a very visceral account um, from somebody who's just on the edge of this uh, encounter. And in fact, um, there's a recent PhD named um, John Besteca, who I, I think is using some of these, some of these materials, our, our um, research overlaps. I, um, for Detroit, Moscow, Detroit, I, I, I read a lot of memoirs by American technical consultants who came back. Um, I didn't, in what I read, find so much about the Holodoma, but I did find evidence that the American technical consultants were aware that they had a, a much, um, they had much more leeway within the system to make mistakes than their Soviet colleagues did. So, but, but what, I'm, what I mean by that is that Soviet engineers on these projects were, um, were often um, uh, blamed for all sorts of you know, issues on the site that were not their fault um, and would be disappeared. So there was there's a, a kind of terror and violence that is just under the surface in, um, in quite a few of these um, uh, letters home with uh, memoirs that are published after the fact too. So I do think um, I do think that's a, a you know a potentially rich um, archival vein you know, to see in a way kind of how um, how this context was being uh, was being kind of lived, absorbed, and then um, and then uh, sort of uh, you know transferred back into into their context after the fact. So I do have a question from one of our online participants, but I am also open to the floor. But uh, uh, Walter Dashko, thanks Hello. you for your research, um, very important research. Um, and here is his question. Can we assume that the appeal of mass-produced Soviet housing types that we see, for example, in Kharkiv or elsewhere in Ukraine uh, what he calls rigidly monotonous in plan and suburban <laughs> or even anti-urban in design uh -huh. is largely restricted to academics and nostalgic architects and uh, designers. I guess that's the, the appeal of the, that type of housing. That mm -hmm. is to say that when it comes to rebuilding the housing destroyed mm -hmm. uh, during the uh, bombing uh, by Russia, the inha inhabitants would perhaps prefer <laughs> other more mm -hmm. urban models of housing. And I think that that was something I had in mind as well. So if you could yeah, address that. Absolutely. I and, mean, and you're in contact with architects in Ukraine, so. Yeah, so I would say, um, Yes, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I completely admit that as a, as a historian of of modernism, I perhaps am nostalgic for buildings that are that are, you know, actually not that great, <laughs> you know, to live in or to look at, right? Um, and what attracts me ab about them, uh, perhaps, is the um, is their kind of story of formation, right, in the, in the context from which they emerge. Um, but they're not for everyone. Completely agreed, and um, you know, as I as I mentioned at the end of the the lecture, the the you know the the panel housing uh, from the Khrushchev era through the the eighties and into the to, to the early nineties um, are also um, easy to dislike. I think. Um, I guess so. This past week, um, in my urban history class with the Hadikut School of Architecture students, who are third year students. Um, and uh, and they presented uh, they did they made a, a presentation on Sifu, which is a kind of a big kind of micro region, uh, uh, basically a um in in Lviv. And we had a really interesting conversation um, about it because in the end they felt that 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 planning actually worked fairly well. Like what they and many of them had grown up in these kind of Nikolayoni. And and they said upon reflection that um, you know the, the playgrounds and the open the, the sort of many positive memories of living in these types of of neighborhoods. And so while they weren't sure 
what they would recommend for kind of post reconstruction Ukraine. But there are there were certain aspects east of the planning, if not the architecture, um, that they would carry forward. So, um, so I think you know you can make sort of very sort of green, lovely neighborhoods, perhaps with better constructed architecture. Um, but uh, but I don't know. I mean, I, I it's it's of course it will be up to them um, what what the architecture looks like after the fact. But uh, yeah. Well, yes, please. Yeah, I have nothing to do with architecture, but this type of uh, gigantic manic uh -huh. area, uh, as well as uh, industrial urban planning, mm -hmm. um, we have experience in that in China as well, northeastern provinces. That we, of course, copied from the Soviet. Yeah, uh -huh. and I just wonder: are these types of things have replicated throughout the Soviet Union? This is the in the first five-year plan. And you know, especially you know, uh, well, when they build replicate, did they replicate the same type of planning like this when they build around behind the Euro, for example, in other parts of the Soviet Union, and then eventually transplanted in all eastern provinces to China? And I find this uh, this type of design aesthetically um, not not much to you know complement in the single purpose. There, I find them dull and gray, mm -hmm. especially in the winter time. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so um, so yes, I mean, this type of planning, which which I would call another way to characterize it as like super block planning, yeah. you know, so you've got a very limited number of architectural uh, building types, and then you kind of organize them on the slight, you know, slightly different ways on the site, but um, but it is uh, fairly homogeneous, like, yeah, like a, a big box uh, <laughs> shopping center, right? Like a that, suburban American, yeah. Scene. Um, so yes, I mean, this type of planning, uh, you know, this is an argument that I, that I was trying to make is like, you know, the, this type of planning, which is somewhat site agnostic. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can take a grid and you can sort of drop it anywhere. You have to make slight adjustments that you can, if you've got the components, you can just, you know, pick it up and like drop it almost, almost anywhere. Um, so yes, I mean, this type of planning was used um, on kind of, you know, Ural's industrial sites. Um, et cetera. And, and you can, even if the buildings are slightly different from site to site, when you pull out and you look at Google Earth, like you can recognize that urban fabric. You can, you can almost like, you know, put, put your finger on more or less the decade it was built. Um, I, I know, I know not so much about, um, about the, the, the transfer from Soviet planning to, to Chinese planning, but I, I know it's a fact. Um, there, in fact, is a student in Eastern Europe as well, maybe perhaps in Eastern Europe. Um, yes, I mean, a, a, a bit later. I mean, certainly the Mikorayon, you know, the kind of 1950s, 60s um, urban residential mm -hmm. kind of block type um, ends up throughout Eastern Europe as well. Um, but I just mentioned this, so there's a, a PhD student over at Daniels who's a landscape architectural historian. Um, who specifically is looking at the ways in which kind of Soviet planning ideals were transplanted to China in the 1950s and the early 1960s. Um, his first name is Taro. I can't remember his, or I don't know his last name, but um, but there are definitely people looking at this. Yeah. Um, Thank you very much. It was a fascinating presentation. Um, Two questions about the time period that you researched, which is basically post um, Great Depression before World War II. Yeah. Uh, so, first question is that when you study war history, almost every geography in every country was impacted by it, it was a global phenomenon. Yeah, sure. So, I wonder how uh, the Soviets were able to deploy resources and invest. So that's the first one. And the second one is that um, in that time period, uh, uh, the United States was a rising power, not the preeminent power. So it was, it's very interesting that the exchange and technology transfer between Russia and the United States, why, why that was uh, chosen, you know, uh, even that the United States was not the preeminent industrial power at the time, based on my understanding. Yeah. There were European powers that were more yeah, 
So, so for the last part of the question, um, uh, Germany was also, there were quite a lot of German, um, both uh, industrial firms, but then also individual kind of technical experts um, who ended up in, in the Soviet Union on these sites as well, um, Czech. Um, and um, so the so the US wasn't the only one. Um, there's a great quote, it would take me too long. Oh, it, actually this isn't even my computer, so I wouldn't be able to get to it anyway, but but um, uh, one of the interesting qu quotes that we, that we pulled for the Detroit Moscow Detroit book um, was from, Kind of a Soviet uh, economic planner who said, um, uh, basically, we we prefer the Americans because um, because they come with um, liquid cash, like they're like they're they're liquid, right? In terms of um, kind of how the economy works, um, they're really flexible. They're like quick on their feet, whereas the the um, the European and I I'm not an economic historian, so I'm just parroting that. Um, but they and he said that the that the European concessionaires in the, in this kind of pre-crash period, um, they basically kind of like had to invest in order to get the kind of like liquid assets back to you know so it was a kind of a longer process and a, and a little bit more circumspect, whereas the you know the Americans are like yeah right <laughs> whatever, um, uh, they were kind of like all in like very quickly. So, so that was one, you know, that was at least from the time that was how, how um, that decision was portrayed. Um, and then your question was, oh, how is it that the Soviets, yeah. again, I have a very cursory understanding because like, it's not my, my area of expertise, but, um, but, but I think it, you know, because it was a closed economy, because it was a closed and command economy, um, the ways in which that kind of um, economic balance sheets worked was, you know, you could take, you could take um, basically the the kind of assets um, from agriculture and just pump them right into into industry. So it wasn't, um, it was a, it was kind of an easier um, economy to, and, and wasn't reliant upon kind of the, the capitalist banking system. Um, so you know we're all the other economies are crashing, they're able to, in a way, kind of take advantage of that gap um, to, to push ahead. Yeah. Yes, sir. You know, I grew up, uh, I was raised, I grew up in Soviet Union, in Stalingrad, by the way, so I was born in this sort of city, uh -huh. like maybe 500 meters from the, the, the line, right? Uh -huh. From my personal experience, it was absolutely shocking, okay? So everything will be the same, uh, the kindergarten, the schools, everything the same. And I really was choking that basically I was trying to fit the system and um, I could, it was very hard. So I wanna ask you as a, as a architecture, uh, do you think it was really an idea as to construct this kind of mm -hmm. art like was marvelous, like awesome? Or you think it was well, because basically it was just the barracks of the people mm. who was working here. You mm. crossing, you crossing the street. You working right. You coming back. Yeah. You're taking a shower. Yeah. You have a shower, right? You eat some food and you coming back to work because the Stalingrad, yes, it's the river. Yeah. Okay. It's the factories. I don't know what you're talking about green zone. I was born. Mm -hmm. I was. I was like six and seven. There was no green zone. Okay. Well, maybe not in Stalingrad. Maybe that might be true. Stalingrad, no, I'm talking about Stalingrad, yeah, right? Yeah. So you opened the the, the, the tractor factory, mm -hmm. I mean, the, across the tractor factory, the window, mm -hmm. and all fresh air right in your oh, face. Oh, right, 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 okay. right, right. It's a so, theoretical proposition, by the way. Right, the wind does not always... Yeah, so it's 102 right. kilometers of the factories yeah. along the river, right? One street, Prospect Lenin, which is the Lenin Prospect, yeah. right? And you're living there, right? So I want to... Ask you as an architecture. Yeah, yeah. Do you think it's absolutely? You, you please tell me like your feelings. It's absolutely marvelous. <laughs> right? Yeah. As an architecture, it's just marvelous. Or I mean, maybe well. Well, so I think you like really have to contextualize within the historical moment first of all, you know, which is to say, so so I just gave a lecture at Daniel's yesterday about interwar New Deal housing, and in that lecture, the setup is is actually 
you know, th they have to read a little bit of Engels, uh, Conditions of the Working Class in England in 1845. And he's got these diagrams in that text, which show you the kind of just, you know, incredible density of the housing blocks and and the sort of quality of life um, in in these sort of industrial cities. If if uh, let's say capital, not to get super political, but I'm just like setting it up. So if if capitalists, you know, if the capital city is left to its own devices, the housing will be horrendous for the working class, right? Um, no windows, no green space, right? Um, so so you know modernist architects who are you know coming onto the scene in the 1920s and the 1930s like they're all in a way trying to figure out a spatial foil right a spatial antidote to to the industrial city of the late 19th century and beginning of the 20th century so that's where you get these very skinny buildings so that you know you've got residential units where you've got windows on both sides you can open the window and you have you know, air kind of coming through. You have natural light. You've got green space that you know everyone can use together. So, so within that historical context, this is quite miraculous, actually. Um, the the architecture um, doesn't, you know, have a lot to recommend it. I agree. So if we look at this, it's I mean it's quite bare bones architecture. Um, but but I think you know again when I when I teach this to architecture students I say okay we may not love the architecture um, there are problems with the political system etc but um, but but isn't it useful to think about um, dwelling to think about living you know and and designing places for living that are more than just a residential unit just a private unit that you think about. Um, what happens to the children? You know, like shops, um, you know, common laundries in this time, we don't have to worry about that quite so much anymore. Um, recreational facilities. So, so thinking about, about um, designing living, like places for living where you understand living as a kind of a broader set of activities. And, um, and I think that is actually really useful to, to take away. Maybe not in this form, Maybe not with this architecture, but there are there are still lessons to be extracted. Um, I think from this experiment. But you know what? Uh, as you can see right away, you can I can see Pavel Alyosin, right? In 1929-1934, that's right in the middle of Polodomor, right? Yeah. So people yes. in Kharkiv, they were lying on the street dying. Yes. Okay. Yes. Genocide. The Pavel Alyosin, by the way, he got this. Uh, um, the MKVD mm -hmm. was asking for this project. MKVD, that's the signal secret police, mm -hmm. right? It's the beginning of Gulag, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's all it's all political, a lot of stuff. Yeah, and the pictures look beautiful. Look at the spaces, right? These are You got photos. your own room, yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah, it's stuff. But yes. it's it's I think it's another genocide because they they doing another slaves for the factory. Because for example, if you were moving from one factory. Stalingrad tractor factory to Krasna Octavity, which is the same, but they're building something different, right? You have to give up your apartment, okay, or your cell, and hopefully they're going to give you another cell. So there's no private property, okay? No, no, of course. Right. Yes. I mean, you know, so, uh, so again, I, I don't, like, I don't, I don't want this project or this research to be understood as apologist for the Soviet system in any way. Um, and, uh, you know, which is why I think is really, you know, really important, maybe not so much within this context, but certainly in an architecture school where people know nothing about the Ukrainian context to, to say, you know, by the way, there are architectural lessons to be learned here, but there was a famine just, just beyond the horizon, right? So yeah. the historical context is incredibly, under, you know, important to understand. So, so I'm not um, in no way am I trying to, you know, to um, to glorify all of the the atrocities of the Soviet state. Uh, instead, I'm saying, you know, like, listen, let like let's let's look at this architecture, which has been maligned. Nobody likes this architecture very much, 
Um, but there were um, some 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 quite strong planning ideas. There were actually some some strong kind of you know kind of social ideas here that um, that are that are worth looking at. Again, even if in the end we we reject them, yeah. Yes, please. Yes. So in the nineteen thirties in Ukraine, who are the people who ended up working in those factories and living in those residences? Did they take some local people who who were willing to collaborate with the Soviets, or did they move in people from other regions? What happened? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know so much about the the labor force in the in the tractor factory itself, but but what I can say is that one of the reasons that have given chosen was because there was a there was a, lo a locomotive factory just nearby that had a very small kind of tractor production line, so they were able to take you know one of the justifications was you can take these these skilled workers that are already in Kharkiv and or de deploy them here um I, I i don't know if they if they brought in workers from other parts of i can try to ask to answer this question okay. if I may. so um if you're going to take a look um all this villages in Slovenia. i mean when you take a look um what kind of people living in the region right it was 18 1897 was a big research by Russian Empire, right? Mm -hmm. And another research was in 1937. By the way, who did the uh, research in 1937, majority of people ended up at Gulag because Stalin didn't like the numbers, okay? Mm -hmm. So they took, uh, and I took Donbass region, it was like the whole, and I took Donbass region, right? In Donbass region, 1980-1997 was majority of Malarosa, which is Ukrainian people, right? In the 1937, the Malaros Ukrainian people who were working in agriculture was like practically diminished, and it was another people from Russian Federation, from Siberia, and something. They they came to Donbas region, so it was basically another genocide that uh, the the Ukrainian kind of like disappear and hold them more and stuff, and they were replaced by Russians and by from another region. I a lot of people came from different parts of the. I want to go, go back to the space because the like I'm thinking there's. You mentioned there were no ki kitchens on. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it's, so it's very interesting. Like, the, <laughs> you have your literally cell. Mm -hmm. Although these are now very desirable, like in places like Tokyo, look a lot. It's right. exactly, especially the image with the yeah, that, that, yeah. That, that you, that's very desired. And that I'm thinking about student dormitories now. This is the move away from shared living to at least having a space with a sink. Mm -hmm. um, it, but there was no opportunity, and this was must have been deliberate, where four or five people might cook together and converse. Um, you wanted everyone corralled into a cafeteria under supervision. So there, there's it's giving you your own space, but like that just seems even if it's small, seems luxurious. But at the same time, there's no opportunity for. Yeah, and then I'm wondering how in the world, what was the basis for kindergartens? Because I would think you had one, did you have couples living in these units or yeah. were these all individuals? So what, or what, how could you have? It was, uh, can I say something? Uh, it was a part of propaganda, all right? So the part of the living like this, you have to be eating what you mentioned, yeah. the common yeah. kitchen, right? So it, it, you're going, you, you're working, you're coming back, you're oh, working, you, you're eating that. in a common but kitchen. But it's deliberate to keep from, you know, yeah, I mean, having that's right. Small, right. Plus, there's no families. Uh, there's a freedom yeah. for the women, okay? They, they also promote. But, but, but yeah, so 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 these large ones, these were where the living cells were. So so individual men and women, you know, mm -hmm. so not non-married, non-married, mm -hmm. single, single people. Um, these ones back here, the four story ones, were uh, had larger families. Okay. So the only ones, um, to the best of my knowledge, that, okay. that, did, that did not have kitchens were these. Okay. Um, and yes, I mean, even though there was this common, there was a common area, I guess, for you to 
no, 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 we do that. Um, chit chat. We certainly don't cook together, right? Because that's all happening. Uh, you know, all of your food provision happens in the, in the canteen, mm -hmm. and workers, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, workers' canteen right there, or at the factory. There is also a canteen at the factory. Um, but but that's an interesting point, mm -hmm. right? So there's no <laughs> possibility for yeah. right um, sure. anything other than like mass. <laughs> Yeah. mass yeah. socialization or something like that there's i didn't mention this detail um but it is interesting that that in this drawing so there were plans to have um these sort of glassy connecting corridors of, above you know on the second floor that would uh connect all of these um uh parts of the of the block so together you to go outside. so you wouldn't have to go outside yeah. but, but that makes those got the term we use now is value engineered. Yeah. <laughs> they were basically um, they were deemed to be too too expensive and too um, I I'm gonna think we're gonna end with that. I I do. I have you been to Robart's library yet? No. And I would maybe Natalia could give you a tour after this uh, if you want to, to see our <laughs> brutalist uh, yeah. uh, masterpiece uh, monster piece. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Christina and Natalia for a, what was really a brilliant um, uh, discussion and presentation. It's many things to think about. I'm so glad that you reached out to us. Um, and I thank our online participants and those of you who came out in person to attend and we give you a hand. Well, thank you. <laughs> we do have another symptom. Right? I, I'm closing it. That you can certainly come up and have a one on one conversation. I think having something similar to that, I think they do have some civil line little flowers that, uh, unlike what we are living right now, as growing up as a kid, you know your neighbors and your mm. children, and it's social gathering that you don't have in a modern city like now. Ever, you don't even know who your neighbors are. Yeah. So I think they, they do have some redeeming values mm -hmm. that we got. Yeah. So, although they, perhaps not planned, but yeah. I mean, I do, and I do think that. Um, let's say what what we might find in a in a you know successful kind of smaller neighborhoods in Canada or the United States, often there's like some sort of social center. Mm -hmm. And often it's the school, you know, so the school became, you know, if you've got school aged children, that becomes almost like a magnet for social interactivity, right? Um, and here they were just, they, you know, they happen to be like designed in for ideological reasons. Mm -hmm. But, um, but again, if we're like, you know, for design students, if we're looking to extract some sort of silver lining or some sort of um, principles for moving forward. It's that, you know, fundamentally, this is like, this is my point to them, like, you know, housing is more than just a unit. Housing is a, you know, ideally it's a community, you're like you're building community. Um, so, yes. Thank you.